All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, tuning in today and happy Friday. Uh, this week, our seminar speaker is Dr. Jivan Rim, who is currently a postdoctoral researcher and society fellow at Dartmouth College. Uh, Dr. Rim is a geobiologist uh, whose research mainly focuses on uh, studying uh, microbial isotopic signatures uh, by combining uh, microbial experiments and isotope analyses. Uh, she received a bachelor's degree in earth and planetary science from UC Berkeley, and then a PhD from MIT uh, from the Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences Department. And uh, after that, she then started her current postdoc at uh, Dartmouth, where she's actually not only doing research, but also doing a little teaching. I've been able to follow her on Twitter, where she's uh, talked a lot about her uh, course uh, uh, development for that. Uh, and so uh, I guess with that, uh, thanks again, uh, Dr. Rim, for taking the time uh, to talk with us um, and uh, take it away. And then just for, for all of you to know, she's going to keep her, her camera off uh, due to some tech issues, but um, uh, we'll uh, plow, plow forward. All right. Thank you so much again. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, and sorry again about the technological issues. Um, I was really looking forward to see everyone, at least virtually, but this is what we'll have to deal with. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Jimin Rim. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share my work with you today. Um, today, I'm going to share a little bit of my work on uh, looking at microbial isotopic signatures that are preserved in biomolecules that are either consumed or um, produced by microbes and how we can use these signatures as a tool to study past and present environments, especially in the context of geomicrobiology. So before we start, I want to take a moment to make a few acknowledgments. Um, as Francis has introduced kindly, I'm currently a postdoc in the Earth Sciences Department at Dartmouth, um, which, uh, uh, which means that all of the work that I do on campus is done on the lands that were forcefully appropriated from the Abenaki and the Algonquin people. Um, I would also like to acknowledge all of my wonderful collaborators shown in these pictures. Um, the first part of the talk will focus on my PhD work that was done at MIT. And then the second part, which will be shorter, um, is a large group collaboration between CU Boulder and Dartmouth. And I'll also present briefly some data generated by this team, collaboration between Dartmouth and Harvard. And these are all of the funding sources. Uh, Jimin, um, we do not see the progression of the slides. Um, oh. am, I, am, I, am I the only one? No, I, same thing here. Okay. Yeah, same here. Let me stop sharing. Maybe I'll need to. It might be a keynote thing. I've heard other people with keynote having problems with blue jeans, I think. Oh, that's a bummer. Okay. Do you see my black background? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay. And do you see my slide now? I see something that's labeled microscopic processes with global impacts, and I think this is slide three. Yes, okay, so you just see the, uh, you see the, the right slide and not the notes. I think so, maybe go up uh, forward and backwards just in case. <laughs> yes, yep. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Thank you. Um, see. Great, thank you uh, in the chat as well. Um, so I am a geomicrobiologist, and that means that I um, often think about the interactions between microbes, tiny microbes, and the Earth system, um, which obviously operate at hugely different scales, both in spatial and temporal scales. Um, and I use isotopic tools and biomarkers to better understand these interactions um, across the different spatio-temporal scales. Um, so I have a methane molecule here and some lipid molecules over here, and these will be the subjects of today's talk. So the talk will be divided into two main parts. The first part will be on the isotope signatures uh, found in methane gas that's produced by microbes. Uh, 
And the second part um, will be shorter relative to part one. Um, and it's my current work as a postdoc in developing um, an em empirical framework for a lipid biomarker um, and how it can potentially be applied as a new paleoenvironmental proxy. So with that um, outline, I will uh, start the first part, um, methane. So here is a cartoon depiction of a methane molecule that has one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms. Um, identifying the sources of methane is important because it uh, plays an important role in the global carbon cycle. It's a potent greenhouse gas, and it also serves as an energy source for us um, and a potential biosignature both on Earth and potentially on other planets as well. Uh, so one extraterrestrial example that got many people excited is the observations of trace methane in uh, the Martian atmosphere. Um, this got so much attention, not only from the scientific community, but also from the public. Um, and I'm sure many of the audience were excited about it too. Um, and this is exactly because of methane's potential as a biosignature. So the reason why methane um, has the potential as a biosignature is that a major fraction of methane released to the atmosphere on Earth, shown in blue fractions here in this pie chart, are microbial in origin. So microbial methanogenesis is an important source of methane on Earth, and it would be beneficial to have a tool that can help us distinguish the biological signal in methane from non-biological signal. So before we talk about how isotopes can be used as a fingerprinting tool, uh, let's briefly go over definitions and some notations. So carbon and hydrogen in methane molecules, they both have two stable isotopes, which are atoms of the same element with different masses. So in most cases, heavier isotopes, um, so in this case, 13C and D for deuterium, um, they uh, are rare or less common in natural abundances. And I'll be using something called delta notation throughout the talk. Um, that is a way of expressing the relative abundance of these heavy isotopes, 13C in this case, um, within a given sample with respect to the abundance of 13C in a standard material that geochemists agree to use as a reference point. So besides the bulk carbon and hydrogen isotopes, we can also measure um, the degree of internal equilibrium among different isotope logs of methane. So we can think of isotope logs as a molecular equivalent of isotopes. Uh, so these are same molecules in terms of their basic chemical composition, um, but that ha they have different combinations of isotopes. So here I'm showing an example of 13CH4, which has one carbon heavy isotope substitution, and isotope log with one heavy hydrogen substitution um, would be 12CH3D, and D stands for deuterium. So methane clumped isotopologs are very rare methane molecules that contain two or more rare isotopes within a single molecule. So here I'm showing a graphic uh, representation of the isotope exchange reaction among the four most abundant methane isotopologs. On the left-hand side, I have a uh, uh, both of these isotopologs are singly substituted, one with 13C, the other with deuterium. And on the right-hand side, I have the clumped isotopolog 13CH3D, as well as the most common species, 12CH4. So we can express the relative abundance of the 13CH3D clumped isotopolog with a metric called cap delta 13CH3D. Um, this is calculated by taking the natural log of the reaction quotient of this isotope exchange reaction. And what's great about the defining cap delta values with the reaction quotient is that when the system is in equilibrium, the reaction quotient Q becomes the equilibrium constant K. Um, and as is true in most cases, equilibrium constants are largely a function of temperature. So this means that the abundance of clumped isotopologs 
indicated by cap delta values. Um, uh, if methane is produced in equilibrium, uh, can serve as a geothermometer. So now that we have some notations defined, let's take a look at how we can use these signatures as a fingerprinting tool. So here's a plot that shows um, carbon isotope compositions delta 13C on the y-axis, and then hydrogen isotope composition delta D on the x-axis. This way of plotting delta 13C versus delta D is useful because natural samples of methane tend to plot in distinct spaces on this uh, plot, depending on their sources. So thermogenic methane, for example, is produced by a non-biological process, um, makes up a large fraction of natural gases. And methane sample that is thermogenic in origin tends to have different delta 13C and delta D values compared to those of microbial methane. So within the microbial methane category, there are two different um, types based on the biochemical pathways broadly defined. One is the fermentation pathway, where microbes eat acetate or methyl compounds. Um, and this occurs uh, often in freshwater environments, surface environments, including lakes, swamps, and the rumen of cow. And the other pathway, CO2 reduction pathway, is thought to be the primary microbial methanogenic pathway in a lot of marine sediment environments. Um, so here I have a picture of gas hydrate as an example of such an, an environment. So for the rest of the talk, I am going to focus on this CO2 reduction pathway. That's, uh, that's what my experimental system was about. Um, but the same isotopic tools can be applied for identifying um, methane produced by the other pathways as well. So this pathway uses carbon dioxide as the carbon source, hydrogen as the energy source, and uh, the four hydrogen atoms in the final product methane ultimately drives from the surrounding water. And marine microbial methane produced via CO2 reduction pathway is often referred to as having equilibrium isotope signals. And that's because the delta 13C and delta D um, of methane that is in equilibrium with CO2 in water, um, that's outlined by this rectangular rectangle, um, largely overlaps with the samples for marine microbial methane. And we also discussed clumped isotope systematics. So here's a graph showing the cap delta value on the y-axis, the relative abundance of 13CH3D clumped isotope log. And then we have temperature on the x-axis. And as mentioned earlier, the cap delta values show dependence on temperature as shown by this equilibrium line here. Um, because the cap delta value is defined by the reaction quotient Q. So when we look at the cap delta values from marine microbial methane samples, they tend to plot along this equilibrium line, um, indicating internal isotopolog equilibrium. And this can be particularly useful. The clumped isotope approach can be really useful for distinguishing microbial methane from thermogenic methane because microbial and thermogenic processes have distinct temperature windows. Um, microbes won't be able to survive in the temperature window um, where natural gases are generated. Um, but the assumption there is that all of these methane samples are produced in equilibrium, and um, that is not the case when the same microbes, same methanogens that use the CO2 reduction pathway um, produce methane in the laboratory. So the isotopic signatures, the lab sample lab cultures produce are in the gray um, data points in both, uh, clumped both bulk isotope space and the clumped isotope abundance space, um, which obviously do not plot in agreement with the natural observations um, in blue. Uh, so this means that we really need to have a f more fundamental understanding of how isotope fractionation happens in nature versus 
in various conditions in the laboratory. So my goal was to um, have a better idea of what factors are controlling these signatures in microbial methane. And my hypothesis was that hydrogen availability must play an important role. Um, that's because hydrogen is an energy source for these microbes using this pathway, as mentioned earlier. Um, and to test that hypothesis, I built uh, this bad batch reactor system. Um, what I mean by semi-open system here is that the growth media is open to gas exchange, um, where a stream of gas is being bubbled through the media constantly. Um, and importantly, uh, what this allows us to do is to be able to control the mixing ratio of hydrogen that is being fed into the system. So in this system, I grew two different species of methanogens and used um, analytical and imaging techniques to quantify their growth, collected methane samples along with other gas um, components, and then the purified samples are um, analyzed for their isotopic compositions, so bulk isotope ratios for the both substrates CO2 and water, and bulk and clumped isotope compositions of methane that's produced. Um, and this is a laser spectrometer that we used um, for this analysis. So I'm going to show the isotope results in three different plots. Uh, carbon for carbon hydrogen isotope fractionation, and then the clumped isotope abundance. Um, so I'll be building up each plot uh, Progressively, so let's start with carbon isotope system. Here we have um, alpha 13 on the y axis. So, alpha here is a fractionation factor, uh, which essentially represents the magnitude of difference between the isotopic composition between substrates and the product. So, in this case, alpha 13 represents the fractionation between CO2 and methane. Um, and that's plotted as a function of hydrogen partial pressure that was tested in experiments. So this is what the data looks like. Um, the dotted horizontal lines in different colors, those are the alpha values that are expected when CO2 and methane are in equilibrium line. So I'll be referring to these as equilibrium lines. The smaller gray symbols on the background, these are data from literature from previous experimental studies sorted by growth temperature ranges. And then the larger color symbols are showing the data from my experiment with um, each color symbol, uh, color and shape combination showing each experimental condition. Um, so that one thing to note is that uh, these data are plotted with time progression in the going down direction. So we can see here that, for example, for the experiment uh, with blue, triangle, left pointing triangle, we have uh, three or maybe there are overlapping data points um, that are changing in alpha values over time. So that means that alpha values decrease um, toward and even beyond uh, going below the equilibrium line in some cases um, as the physiological state changes in the system um, and cell density increases. So I want you to uh, remember this trend, um, larger than equilibrium carbon isotope fractionation, as I'll come back to this in a few slides. And then for hydrogen isotope system, I have alpha 2, which is the fractionation between water and methane, um, and same x-axis hydrogen partial pressure. So the behavior of hydrogen isotope system was different from that of carbon isotope system in that uh, alpha 2 was relatively constant throughout time and changes in physiological states within an experiment, um, and that these values are far from that expected at equilibrium. So that's indicated by the distance between the equilibrium line and the, the symbols. For clumped isotope system, I have cap delta values on the y-axis, um, representing the abundance of clumped isotopes. 
And similar to carbon isotope system, the cap delta values also changed um, both as a function of time and also um, with the changes in physiological state of the system. Um, what's important to note here is that the direction of changes were different. In this case, um, the cap delta values are changing, decreasing in the direction away from equilibrium, unlike how it changed towards equilibrium in carbon isotope system. So uh, for clumped isotope system, another thing to note is that uh, the current data set expands the range of partial pressure of hydrogen tested uh, by about an or two orders of magnitude um, because clumped isotope analysis for methane is a relatively new technique, and um, almost all of the batch experiments done since 20 2014 um, were done with very high hydrogen partial pressure in closed system, and that's why we have a cluster of gray symbols um, at 10 to the fifth uh, Pascal, which is about an atmospheric um, pressure. Um, so by expanding this tested range, um, a clear pattern emerges. That's the decreasing cap delta values as a function of decreasing hydrogen partial pressure. So I know that was a pretty dense slide. Um, so these observations left me with a couple of key questions. So I was curious about what is causing the carbon to fractionation factor to be larger than equilibrium in some cases. We know that equilibrium signals are observed in nature, um, but what is the mechanism for driving the alpha value to exceed equilibrium? And then the next question was as to why the clumped ice chip abundance move away from equilibrium with decreasing partial pressure of hydrogen. Um, previous understanding from modeling studies have been that cap delta values are expected to increase toward equilibrium at lower hydrogen concentrations, as those are the um, conditions that are more representative of the env natural environment. So to answer these questions, we need to think about what happens inside of a methanogen cell. So here's a hypothetical cell with carbon dioxide entering the cell and methane being produced. And um, this, in this very overly simplified view, the cell is treated as a black box um, that just generates methane from CO2. Um, but that is, of course, in reality, not true. Um, there is a set of complicated machinery that converts CO2 to methane in four different reduction steps um, among several other intermediate steps, and each of which catalyzed by um, enzymes. So even this is a pretty simplified view of the biochemical pathway, um, but we built a mathematical framework that considers some of the most important steps in terms of isotope fractionation, um, namely the four reduction steps to model the behaviors of isotope fractionation under different scenarios. So I won't go uh, into much detail about the three different scenarios that we explored, but I would be happy to talk more um, with anyone interested later. Um, I will mention here, though, that the behavior of isotope fractionation is modeled as a function of metabolic re reversibility. So reversibility in this context means the ratio of backward to forward fluxes uh, for a given enzymatic step. And we can parameter, parameterize this reversibility term as a function of dissolved hydrogen concentration um, so that we can simulate the effects of hydrogen concentration on isotope fractionation. Of these three scenarios, I want to highlight just the last one, differential reversibility scenario. Um, in this uh, scenario, the last step of methanogenesis, the reduction of methyl group to uh, methane, is set to be less reversible compared to the previous three re reduction steps. And the rationale for trying out this scenario, uh, which had not been tried before, is that uh, this is the most energy yielding step in methanogenesis, 
uh, which would therefore likely be less re reversible compared to um, the previous less thermodynamically favorable steps. So I'll show the model results for the differential reversibility scenario only in these three plots, because that's where the most interesting observations were. Um, again, I'm showing the three plots for carbon, hydrogen, and clumped isotope abundance. So for carbon isotope system, we have alpha 13 on the y-axis um, as a function of dissolved hydrogen concentration instead of partial pressure on the x-axis. Um, and that's because uh, the dissolved form is the form that's used by methanogens. And the horizontal... No! Oh, sorry. No! Sorry, my puppy got very excited. Um, the horizontal lines are equilibrium lines that we uh, saw before, and the solid lines are the model results. So the model trajectory recreated the decrease in alpha 13 values, not only toward, but also um, going beyond the equilibrium line um, and at about hydrogen concentrations below micromolar range, uh, we start to see the alpha value increase back toward equilibrium. So uh, one thing to note here is that the, this sort of U-shape trajectory, nonlinear trajectory in alpha 13 um, was not reproduced in other scenarios and only in the differential reversibility scenario. For hydrogen isotope system, we have alpha-2 on the y-axis and same hydrogen concentration on the x-axis. And the relatively little change in um, alpha-2 values and also predominantly kinetic signals indicated by the distance between equilibrium line and the symbols uh, were also largely uh, true in the modeled scenario as well. For the clumped isotope system, this was the most exciting part for me. Um, the puzzling trend of decreasing cap delta values was also reproduced in the differential reversibility scenario. Um, I won't have time to get into all of the details of the specific parameters that affect the model, but an important takeaway here is that differential reversibility was required, at least within the conditions we explored, in order to produce this um, nonlinear behavior of clumped isotope ratios. So overall, our experimental and model results show that isotope fractionation pattern as a function of energy availability um, which is a proxy for dissolved hydrogen concentration for these methanogens, um, these patterns may not be linear. And that physiological state, um, the growth phase, for example, that changes over time, as well as the dissolved hydrogen concentration, um, these nuances need to be considered when we interpret the isotope signatures of microbial methane. So to put everything into perspective, um, this is not a new figure. Uh, the, the three panels at the bottom are the same figures you saw in the previous slide, just stretched out a bit, um, because I wanted to fit this in the range of hydrogen concentrations found in both in natural and typical natural environments and typical laboratory experiment conditions um, to give you a, a parallel comparison. So. First, we learned that bulk carbon and hydrogen, as well as clumped ice to fractionation, um, could be explained by uh, our model when differential reversibility is considered. For the conditions tested in the model, the results suggest that equilibrium signals may be observed at submicromolar concentrations of hydrogen, um, which is typically which is consistent it, with what is typically found in natural environments. For example, the marine sediments that we uh, typically observe equilibrium signals in uh, methane isotopes is on the order of nanomolar of hydrogen in um, range. And the challenge comes in, um, the challenge is that 
um, it is very difficult to create and maintain very low concentration of dissolved hydrogen um, in an experimental system. And this discrepancy between tested and observed hydrogen concentration likely contributes to the discrepancy we see in the isotope signatures uh, between lab cultures and natural samples. But overall, um, I think it is helpful to have a combined analysis of both bulk and clumped isotope abundances, um, as these, all of these nuances uh, may not necessarily be revealed when we um, analyze only one of the three um, available isotope systems. Uh, there's more details in a, a preprint. Um, you can scan this QR code if you would like to check that out. Um, so that brings us to the second part of the talk. Um, I did intend this to be uh, relatively shorter than the first part. So I'll spend um, the next 10 minutes or so about uh, talking about hydrogen isotope signatures and archaeal lipid biomarkers. So biomarkers are natural products that have uh, tractable and particular biological origins. Um, the reason why lipid biomarkers are particularly useful is because they can be preserved in the rock record for a long time. So shown here are different types of biomolecules that can record information about the environment um, and their preservation potentials as a function of um, time and log scale on the left side. Uh, so we can see that lipids can endure long periods of time on the order of tens to hundreds of million years. Um, and this allows us to access information about the environment or biology um, on a geologic, his, uh, geologic time scale. So I'm gonna share one example from a eukaryotic biomarker um, to show you how this has been applied. Um, so this, is, this plot is showing um, a really good correlation between the hydrogen isotope composition of n alkane. This is a compound found in the le uh, waxy part of uh, leaves of plants. And x-axis is the hydrogen isotope composition of rainwater. Um, so we have this good correlation, um, and that's because the water that gets incorporated into plant biomass reflects how water isotope fractionates during hydrologic cycles. So as seawater evaporates and rainwater preferentially drops heavy isotopes as it moves away from the coast and um, higher up in latitude, uh, we have uh, more and more depleted rainwater isotope signatures, generally speaking. So if we have an understanding of this physical process and a good calibration for leaf wax isotopes like this, we can use the signatures as a paleo-hydrological proxy. So lipids produced by not eukaryote, eukaryote um, but bacteria can tell us something else that is useful. Um, so for the interest of time, I uh, will, won't go into detail here, but this figure shows the uh, vast range of hydrogen isotope fractionation um, between lipid and water. So this epsilon is equivalent to uh, the alpha fractionation factor we've been talking about. Um, and these bacteria were grown on different carbon substrates um, shown in different colors here. Um, and the main takeaway from the study was that uh, the range of fractionation observed is largely due to the isotope effects uh, associated with the generation of NADPH. This is an electron important electron donor in biological processes. Um, and therefore, bacterial lipid biomarkers are um, really interesting for studying bacterial metabolisms um, rather than a hydrological proxy. So in this uh, tree of life uh, of biomarkers diagram, we have seen, uh, we've talked about a an example from the domain eukarya with leaf wax isotopes um, and also a bacterial lipid and their, um, what they can tell us. Um, and that leaves us with the whole domain of life, archaea, whose lipid biomarkers remain largely unexplored. 
um, it would be really nice to have a microbial um, microbial hydrogen isotope biomarkers uh, besides plants because microbes have a much broader range of habitats and environments they can tolerate compared to plants. Um, so it would be nice to have a proxy for archaeolipids. Um, so with some recent advances in lab protocols, we are now at an exciting moment in time where we both have the sample processing strategy for archaeolipids and the analytical capability to make hydrogenized measurements on these compounds. So with those recent advances, we are uh, starting to get uh, new data on the hydrogen isotope composition of archaeolipids for the first time. So I'm going to show data from my collaborators' experiments where two different archaea were grown in a continuous culture or a chemostat setup. So Sulfolobus acetocaldareus is a thermoacidophile, so they live in high temp, low pH. Um, and in this experiment, they were grown as a heterotroph on um, eating sugar and respiring oxygen. Nitrous supumulus maritimus is a um, abundant autotrophic uh, ammonia oxidizing archaea in the water column in the ocean. Um, so they grow at much lower temperature, neutral pH, um, and they use ammonia and oxygen. So these plots show, again, the epsilon value, that's the fractionation between lipid and water, as a function of uh, growth rate or doubling time on the x-axis. There are a lot of exciting details of this data set, um, but for now, I just want to point out that we see distinct isotope signals from these two organisms or two experiments, about 50 per mil difference in the weighted average isotope fractionation um, across all of these data points. So what could these different magnitudes of isotope fractionation tell us is the question. Um, it's really exciting that there is a significant difference, um, a detectable difference between these two experiments. But because there were multiple differences between the experiments, including the organisms themselves, pH and temperature, carbon metabolism, um, it's difficult to tease apart what factor exactly is contributing to the magnitude of epsilon. So the goal of my study was to test these variables independently. And for the experiment that I'll show in the next slide, um, I am aim to test the role of carbon metabolism. And ideally, this is done using just one model organism, so there's no species effect. Um, so to test that, we needed a metabolically flexible organism that can grow as a heterotroph and autotroph. So that was the reason why I chose Archaeoglobus fulgidus. Um, this is a sulfate-reducing archaea that's capable of doing both metabolisms. Um, so Archaeoglobus was grown on different carbon substrates, electron donor acceptor pairs, um, and importantly, the growth media was labeled with different hydrogen isotope spikes. So um, the purpose of that is to keep track of how much of the water hydrogen isotope pool ends up in it being incorporated in the final product lipid hydrogen pool. So after the growth experiments, um, I do a total lipid extraction, <clears throat> followed by an important step of ether cleavage. Um, this is a uniquely uh, required step for archaeal lipids because their isoprenoid chains are linked with, uh, so this, is, this applies for tetraether fraction. Um, they're, the isoprenoid chains are connected with ether bonds, um, and that's a unique characteristic of archaeolipids as opposed to bacterial or eukaryotic lipids. Um, so that leaves us with a 5 phytane product, which is actually small enough so that it can actually go onto these different instruments um, for compound identification, quantification, and finally, the hydrogen isotope uh, analyses. So I'm going to jump right into isotope analysis results. I'm showing the two heterotrophic conditions on the left and one autotrophic condition um, 
on the right. X-axis is the isotopic composition of water. Um, I switched from delta D to delta 2H now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and the y-axis is the hydrogen isotope composition of the product lipid. And the reason why we want to plot the data in this uh, way is that this allows us to visualize the isotope mass balance equation. So this equation is essentially describing that the total amount of heavy isotopes in the product lipid is the sum of heavy isotopes in the precursors. So the first term represents water isotope pool. The second term represents the substrate pool. So for example, in the case of heterotrophy, this would be lactate isotope composition. Um, so our lipid here is the equivalent to the y-axis in our graph. Our W for water is equivalent to the x-axis. Um, so we can see that the slope of this regression curve would represent this term, which is the combination of x water and alpha. x water here uh, is the fraction of lipid bound hydrogen that originates from water. And the um, alpha, we're familiar with this by now, that's the fractionation between lipid and water. So this is the slope, um, how the slopes look like. Um, importantly, the slopes show dependence on different carbon metabolisms where heterotrophic conditions resulted in relatively low slopes and then um, autotrophic condition had a sl steeper slope. Um, so higher slope, again, means higher fraction of hydrogen originating from water and or higher isotope fractionation. Um, from the proxy application standpoint, we're really interested in teasing apart this X water fraction um, because that would tell us whether the delta D value of archaeolipids found in old rocks or extraterrestrial samples, for example, um, whether that can tell us something about the environmental water in the past. Um, to do this, though, uh, we do need to characterize all of the isotope composition of substrates as well um, to distinguish between these two. Um, so I am currently in the process of doing that, um, but the overall data so far suggests that there could be a larger fraction of lipid hydrogen deriving from water during autotrophy. So, we now have data from these three organisms. Um, and I just want to end on three um, observations from all of these combined results. Um, so <clears throat> first observation, here is a plot with isotope fractionation from the, uh, my collaborator's work. Um, so we have epsilon on the y-axis again, and the weighted average difference of about 50 per mil between the heterotroph and autotroph. And these are all of the data from my experiments with Archaeoglobus. And uh, there is a caveat. We can't directly compare these experiments. They were uh, a set of differences um, that would uh, make it not correct to make direct comparisons. Um, but it is really interesting that overall, um, all of the epsilon values observed in archaeolipids so far are in the negative range, and that um, larger epsilon values seem to be correlated with autotrophy. So you might recall from the bacterial lipid data, this was a slide that I showed before, um, both in terms of direction and magnitude, epsilon values had a large range spanning about 500 per mil. And these are the archaeal data points that uh, where they would fit in this axis. Um, this means that uh, there is a potential constant offset in isotopic composition of lipid with respect to water, um, which is a really promising indication as a paleoenvironmental proxy. Um, and the third and last observation is that um, growth phase might also have partial effects on the magnitude of isotope fractionation. So I've sep actually separated each carbon, metab uh, carbon metabolism condition data into exponential versus stationary phase. Um, and <clears throat> it seems that overall, the isotope fractionation is larger um, during stationary phase compared to auto uh, um, exponential phase. <clears throat> 
Um, these are batch cultures again, so there are other complicating factors that could be affecting this result. So my next step is to grow Archaeoglobus in a continuous culture like the previous work and really tease apart what's, ca what's causing the difference in the magnitude of epsilon. Uh, <clears throat> I think I am running out of time. Um, I'm going to leave the two main figures um, from the about the project that I talked about today. Um, as an experimental geomicrobiologist, um, I, I take quite a reductionist approach, I would say, um, but I hope that some of the findings shed light on the fundamental mechanism of isotope fractionation in these biomolecules um, that will hopefully provide useful framework if and when we were to work with um, extraterrestrial samples, for example, for astrobiology studies. Um, so thank you so much for your attention, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for uh, that great talk. Yeah, um, I'm going to stop the recording real quick, and and then uh, yeah, if people have questions, feel free to, again to, to unmute and um, ask the question directly, or you can uh, put it in the chat. Let me stop the recording real quick. Yeah.